she opened her eyes slowly, and as she came out of her drowsy state, she realized the warmth that lay behind her and, accompanying it, the scent of magnolias. She flinched as she realized just who lay behind her, her eyes rounding in surprise. Jumbled thoughts raced through her mind as she wondered what had happened for him to be with her, when he was supposed to be with another concubine, and what worried her more was that she'd slept through his arrival. Her face flushed a deep red and her heartbeat picked up its pace as she thought once more that he'd come to visit her. She turned to look at him but he didn't wake upon her shuffling, which Bayan found strange since he usually got up at sunrise. She reached out to him as she noticed his pallor, but she stopped as her hand caught her eye, or, to be precise, the blood that rubbed off on his face, blood from her hand. Unable to comprehend what she saw, she paled as she saw the blood that coated her hands. She looked around in alarm, trying to find the cause of all this blood. She knew it couldn't be hers, and so she pulled the blankets back, already knowing what she'd find but still dreading it all the same. She screamed out his name in terror, and her loud voice alerted the attendants that something was wrong. They rushed in to find a distraught Bayan covered in blood and an unconscious emperor in bed, and they panicked too. Mayanga assessed the emperor's state, and it was indeed a dire situation, as he announced that the emperor had lost too much blood and shouted for someone to call the court physician immediately. Blood flowed freely from the emperor's hand, and Mayanga tried to stem the wound until the physician came and he poured medicinal powder on the emperor's bloody hand. And soon enough, the physician arrived, and Mayanga informed him of the situation. He'd used blood stopper powder and their best quality Rayona. But the physician told him that Rayona wouldn't work in the situation. He pulled out his acupuncture needles and strategically applied them to the emperor's body, and Mayanga fussed behind him until he could take it no more. He gave Mayanga a good scolding, and he asked how Mayanga could be so negligent as to leave his majesty in such a state. Had Mayanga forgotten the fact that his madness returns whenever his body is in a state of extreme blood loss? and not to mention that his reprimandable behavior had put her highness in jeopardy as well. Mayanga could only stay silent in the face of his fury because he knew the court physician was right, he hadn't thought that far ahead, and he wondered if all this would have been avoided if he'd taken better care of the emperor the previous night. Thinking back, he recalled the moment the emperor had held an unconscious Bayan in his arms, and as he'd walked back to her room, Mayanga had worryingly called out to the emperor as he suggested they treat the wound on his hand, which still bled heavily. But the emperor had brushed it off lightly as he told Mayanga, no need. And watching them leave, their attendants stood pale and anxious. Suyan had asked Mayanga if they should treat the emperor's wound, but Mayanga sighed, exhausted as he knew about the emperor's bullheadedness, and he told Suyan so. They wouldn't be able to convince him to leave that room before the night's end because the emperor's stubbornness was an especially rare case. On the battlefield, he'd fight on with wounds even greater than the one he'd gotten now, and no one could stop him. So they could do nothing but hope that they would rise early next morning for treatment. It would be all right for them to wait until morning, or so Mayanga had thought, and now he'd regretted not insisting the emperor get treated the night before since he now realized how deep the wound truly was. The physician said that his bleeding worried him even more than the wound, and his words distressed Mayanga all the more. But Bayan spoke up, and at the sound of her voice, Mayanga looked up. Hand me a knife or any sharp object, she ordered, but her words confused him. She repeated herself as she held her hand out, waiting for Mayanga to comply with her order. Soon, Mayanga was struck by realization, and he quickly handed Bayan a knife. But the physician knew not what the reason could be, and alarmed, he shouted out, questioning what they planned to do with that. But Bayan didn't have time to explain, and she gently but firmly pushed the court physician out of the way, her actions surprising him. Bayan lifted the knife up, and she slashed forward, stabbing at her hand to keep her wound open long enough to give the emperor her blood, and the physician could only look on, horrified by her actions. Her hand bled profusely, and hoping this was enough, Bayan grabbed the emperor's injured hand and squeezed until blood dripped from her clenched fist. And as if a miracle were happening before their very eyes, the emperor's wound was sealed shut in a matter of seconds. Never having witnessed anything like this before, they gasped in wonder as if watching God's blessing being bestowed upon the emperor.
She leaned forward and squeezed her fist once more, and blood dripped onto his lips, but the emperor didn't drink it. She urged him to drink the blood, but he couldn't as he lay there in a state of unconsciousness. And seeing his unresponsiveness, she grabbed his head as she grew desperate, willing him to please drink it. Mayanga grabbed at the emperor's head as he offered his assistance, and he shouted at the court physician to help as well with his acupuncture skills. As he got ready to help, Bayan's voice stopped him. No, let me do it, she said, but the court physician insisted that his acupuncture skills were most effective. Mayanga, who knew of Bayan's long-standing ability to heal with her blood, told the physician that her highness was a CEO with healing powers, so they should trust that she knew what she was doing. But the court physician didn't believe in the healing abilities of the CEO, and he felt that those healing abilities were not reliable enough for the emperor. But Mayanga refuted his statement as he told the court physician that he'd seen with his own eyes what her highness had done with the emperor's hand, and the physician could say no more. It was indeed true that he'd witnessed just now the healing abilities of her highness, and he wondered if that really was the power of the CO. From his experience, he'd seen the effects of the CO's Ryona that only reached skin deep, with wounds still left untreated underneath the surface. And even with his years of research, he'd come to the same conclusion with the highest quality Ryona made with the power of multiple CO. But his eyes didn't deceive him, as he'd seen the entire wound heal up perfectly with the power of just one CO, and she'd done it through the use of her own blood at that. And watching her highness attend to the emperor, the court physician couldn't help but wonder where her immense power came from. Looking at the emperor, Bayan knew that while his hand had healed up, the emperor needed to drink Bayan's blood for him to regain consciousness. She hesitated because she knew of one way to get the emperor to drink her blood and Mayanga noticed her undecided demeanor, and he wanted to know what was on her mind. But Bayan didn't answer, and she instead bit her tongue. Everyone gaped in horror at Bayan's strange actions, unsure why she would bite herself. But she had no time to explain as her tongue throbbed painfully. Speaking slowly, she said that this was the only way, and she leaned forward. She implored softly as she said, Please, your majesty, won't you open your mouth? Kissing him, she hoped her plan would work, and soon she pulled back as he opened his mouth. Her blood trickled slowly into his own. The taste of her blood that he enjoyed so much entered his mouth, and his jaw relaxed enough for Bayan to feed him more blood. Soon his eyes opened to see Bayan, who kissed him, and he called her name softly. And seeing him awake, Bayan turned to the court physician, as she excitedly announced that the emperor was awake. The physician rushed forward and gave the emperor a quick examination, and he concluded that while the emperor had a quick pulse, all else was well. In fact, the wound on his hand had healed cleanly too. And soon the physician got quite emotional, and he ordered with tear-filled eyes that the emperor be more vigilant with his health. He'd shaven off some years of the old man's life with the scare he'd given the physician, and he hoped to live to a ripe age as the emperor's humble servant. The emperor laughed in agreement as he recalled that his physician used to say the same thing on the battlefield. But soon the emperor's attention was diverted behind his physician as he saw a nervous Bayan who sat quietly twiddling her fingers. Holding out his hand for her, he called her name, hoping she'd come to him, but she didn't, and soon he said in a calm voice, My arm hurts. Alarmed, Bayan rushed forward, already looking the emperor over for potential injury, and he smiled slyly, knowing his trick had worked. Knowing that something was wrong, he asked Bayan, and she hesitantly answered, if only I hadn't, but she didn't complete her statement, and the emperor wondered if she remembered the past night's events. Urging her to continue, she held his hand as she said sadly that if she hadn't gotten up so late, he wouldn't have bled so much, and upon hearing her words, the emperor was glad that she had no recollection of the previous night because he didn't want her to hold such sorrowful memories. He ordered her to look at him as he said that he sat there in good health, and it was all thanks to the large amount of blood she'd fed him. But Bayan remained worried for the emperor, but he assured her that her healing powers were strong enough to drive away his madness, so she needed to trust herself and her abilities. And his comforting words brought forth a tidal wave of emotions in Bayan, and soon tears ran down her cheeks, and Bayan cried out the fear that she'd bottled up.
feared that she'd almost lost the emperor forever, the man that looked at her with those burning red eyes. I'm right here beside you, and that won't change forever, he told her gently. And if she couldn't trust herself, that was all right because he trusted her. He spoke softly, but the weight of his words rang through to Bayan. I will give you all the confidence you need, and if you're too weak, I will help you become strong. All you need to do is smile, cry, and fall asleep in my arms, that's all. His words were a comfort that Bayan hadn't known she needed, and she cried silently as she nodded, accepting the emperor's words. The emperor watched as she cried, and he didn't stop her because he knew she needed to. And as he looked at her, her tear-streaked face, her red nose paired with her unruly mop of black hair, he couldn't help but think, this is all mine. Mine once and for all, never to be shared with anyone else. And later in the day, Bayan sat gazing out the window as she listened to the sounds of chirping birds and nothing else. She'd found it unbelievable that so many things had happened just this morning. The emperor had explained that the bloodletting had made her a bit feverish, and he'd ordered her to rest inside for the day. He'd given her a sweet kiss on the brow, and he'd left. And the innocent gesture still made Bayan blush uncontrollably, so much so that she dove onto the table to hide her flushed face in her arms. She recalled the night her mom had died, and all she could do was sit there and cry. How terrible it was to see your loved one die in front of your eyes and not be able to do anything about it. And Bayan didn't want to feel that way anymore. It was the sense of powerlessness that overcame her being when she lost someone dear to her, and that was the reason she tried so hard to heal anyone who was hurt, because it helped her forget the despair she'd felt that day. But today was different because the moment she realized she might have lost the emperor, her mind went blank, void of any thought, and all she could do was save him. But just what was the emperor to her? The more she thought about it, the more confused she became because she couldn't understand her actions or her emotions. Glancing down at the blank sheets of paper, she thought back to a saying she'd heard. There are fools who don't know their own minds, and she knew now that she was one of them. She was but one of the five concubines of the emperor of a land in which it's normal for one man to have several wives. She sighed tiredly because how could she ever think of possessing him solely? And her sudden thoughts surprised her so much that she sat up straight. Did she want his majesty? She was already his concubine, but he had four more, and that was something Bayan didn't like. And she now understood her chaotic thoughts because she didn't want to just have him, she wanted to possess the emperor thoroughly. She wanted him to be solely hers and hers alone. Bayan finally understood the feelings that had bloomed in her heart, feelings that had crept upon her and surprised her. She knew now that it was not enough to just have him. She needed him to be hers entirely because she'd fallen deeply for him. She thought back to the words he said as she'd cried in front of him, and by his words, Bayan was certain that the emperor held at least a bit of affection for her. Questioning herself, she grew frustrated at her thoughts, and she groaned, hoping that what she thought wasn't just wishful thinking. At the time, the words he'd spoken sounded like a marriage proposal, but she knew he could have just said those words to calm her down. She sighed, wishing there was someone she could confide in about her jumbled thoughts, but alas, she didn't have anyone like that. Looking ahead, she looked for the trinkets her mother had left, and when she couldn't find them, Bayan screamed for Suyin panicked, and Suyin rushed to Bayan, worried at her unusually raised voice. She came into the room, and she'd found a trembling Bayan with a fearful gaze. She'd wanted to know where the red orbs and the jade knife she'd left on the table were, and she told Suyin that they were gifts from her mother, gifts she couldn't lose. And at the thought of those items being lost, her fear overtook any rationality, and she cried. But Suyin quickly assured Bayan that her precious items weren't lost because Suyin had simply held on to them for safekeeping. She explained that since there were many people coming and going into their palace, she'd move them out of the way in case they'd gotten lost. And as she pulled out a small brown bag, Bayan smiled and thanked Suyin. But soon her emotions overcame her at finding her mother's gifts, and she cried tears of happiness and relief as she expressed her gratitude to Suyin but Suyin waved her gratitude off as she instead apologized to Bayan for giving her such a scare. But Suyin knew she couldn't reveal the truth of that night. 
She'd taken those items to clean the blood off, but she'd forgotten to put them back after the commotion. If she'd known that those items were keepsakes from Her Highness's mother, she would have been more careful with them. Smiling, she told Bayan that the bag that contained her precious items was rather worn out, and Bayan explained that the bag too came from her mother, and she couldn't bear to part with it. Rummaging in her sleeves, Suyin pulled out a pretty pouch, and she offered it to Bayan. Bayan could keep her gifts in there, and when Bayan hesitated to receive such a gift, Suyin insisted that she accept it. At her insistence, Bayan took it, and she smiled sweetly as she thanked Suyin once more. And upon noticing Bayan's tousled locks, Suyin offered to comb them. And as she tended to Bayan's hair, she couldn't help but notice the joy Bayan radiated from the gift she'd received from Suyin. She fiddled with the little pouch, never once putting it down, and Suyin knew she would have given it to Her Highness sooner had she known that she'd like it so much. But curious about those red orbs, Suyin eventually asked about them, and Bayan told her they were divination orbs that she'd received from her mother, who was a sibyl. Suyin was astounded by the special aura they gave off, and Bayan proudly stated that her mother was a very powerful sibyl. She told only five fortunes a day, and when she was younger, people would come from far and wide just to wait in line. Amazed once more by Bayan's story, Suyin wanted to know if those orbs had strong powers as well, but Bayan laughed, unsure herself. Her mother hadn't used those orbs for fortune-telling, and when Suyin wanted to know the purpose of those orbs, Bayan pondered it for a while before she admitted that she too didn't know. She recalled the words her mom had spoken as she'd explained to Bayan the meaning of those orbs. Her mother had told her that they could be swallowed to cure sickness or one could swallow it with their partner to become one with their soulmate. But before she could tell Suyin any of this, she gasped as realization dawned on her. Suyin, unaware of Bayan's thoughts, asked if she liked her hairstyle, but she didn't answer. Instead, she'd sprung out of her seat so suddenly, startling Suyin. I've got to go, Bayan exclaimed, and a surprised Suyin wanted to know where. She turned and made her way to the door, as she said she needed to go to the emperor's office. Suyin wanted to call a carriage, but Bayan hurriedly said that there was no need since she would go by herself. Suyin sat confused by her sudden actions and called out to Bayan, but she'd already left. At the emperor's office, the men lined up and waited anxiously for the emperor to address them. Gerang wondered the reason for calling on all of them since this had never happened before and he wondered if perhaps they'd committed a mistake that needed berating. Or could he have special orders for them? All the men in the room were high-status officials, including Juhil, the court physician Gangyom, and Mac Rim, one of the black wraiths. And as the emperor sat in silence, reading through a document, the more nervous Gerang grew. He was sure that he'd done nothing wrong, but he knew there were a few reasons for his guilt, so could it be that which the emperor wanted to scold him about? His voice broke the long, stretched silence, and the loudness of it in the quiet room startled Gerang. The emperor asked Makrim if his sister had the sleepwalking sickness as well, and his question caused Gerang to flinch because he knew now that this was about her highness. Makrim hadn't spoken up for some time, and the emperor commanded, Answer me. Makrim bowed slightly as he answered, Yes. The emperor wanted to know what type of symptoms one would have with sleepwalking sickness, and Makrim explained that his sister would get up during the night and she would walk around the house, almost as if she were seeking something, and he'd never asked, but Makrim was sure that she looked for their parents. Gerang knew a little bit about Makrim and the story behind his parents' murder. He'd heard that his parents were murdered by thieves and that his sister had had the misfortune of being the one who'd found them dead. The emperor didn't get into all the grim details and simply wanted to know about the treatment. Makrim explained that during the times he was at home, he would ply her with sleeping powder to keep her from sleepwalking, but after he'd gone to war, she'd gotten betrothed. But it seemed like ill fortune followed her because after her in-laws found out about her sleepwalking, they turned her away, thinking she was possessed by a demonic spirit and unable to bear it anymore, she'd taken her life some years ago. As they listened to Makrim, the men in the room all thought the same thing. How sad and unfortunate a tale it was, and all because so many still believe that sleepwalking is an act of devilish possession. It was for this very reason that many people still hid their illness from doctors, lest it become public knowledge.
Gang Yong knew that it was not a matter of a devil's act, but simply an illness, yet he also could not help but be wary after he'd heard about Her Highness's illness. Gang Yong informed the emperor that there were records of Her Highness's lady-in-waiting visiting the apothecary for several herbal concoctions along with the usual teas ordered. Most of them were sleep aids or herbs to calm the spirits, and from the looks of it, she'd made several attempts to help Her Highness. The emperor concluded that, despite her many attempts, she'd failed to heal Bayan of her illness. And looking at his palm, he thought about his lady once again. A lady he'd thought of as innocent and pure, but he now realized how wrong he was. He recalled her asking for power, but how could he have known the reason behind it was something that ailed her so much? He'd been oblivious to the pent-up emotions and angst she hid behind that bright smile. Gang Yom said as much to the emperor. While she smiled brilliantly on the outside, her spirit inside slowly withered away. And the problem lied in her highness herself, since she too knew nothing of the pain she hid away. In order to get better, she must first come to know her own state. The emperor asked Gang Yom if those symptoms only appeared on certain days, and Gang Yom explained that when the patient is tired physically, the symptoms may not appear. Thinking about it, he realized that Gang Yom's words rang true since, the days they spent the night together, she didn't exhibit any symptoms. Wanting to know the possible treatments, Gang Yom told the emperor that it was not a matter of medicines but more of physical therapy, and that was to tackle the very root of the illness. The emperor didn't say it aloud, but he wondered if it would be a better idea to wipe out Ganic village since that could be the root of Bayan's illness and it would be easy enough to fabricate any number of reasons to annihilate them. But was that truly what Bayan wanted? Unsure, the emperor would first have to find out about her past and the cause of her trauma. Especially about the incident related to the mother that she cried out in longing for. Confirming once more, the emperor asked Gang Yom if Bayan's lady-in-waiting had been procuring herbs for her, and when Gang Yom said yes, he ordered that Gang Yom give Bayan a thorough examination, and he was to treat her with his best medicines. You may use all ingredients, the emperor commanded and Gang Yom flinched, taken aback by the emperor's order. He knew the weight of those words. The emperor had essentially commanded Gang Yom to use precious medicines that were held on reserve only for treating emperors. He bowed in consent all the while thinking that the emperor must truly care for his concubine. Next, he turned his attention to Gay Rang, and the emperor told him that he should already be aware of the reason he was called in. But Gay Rang had no idea why he was there. He understood why the rest were called in, but he was uncertain of his role in this meeting. But the emperor informed him anyway, and he told Gay Rang that tomorrow he would be leaving for the Seo village, and he would be accompanied by two of the Mu Ko. Gay Rang was surprised by this order, and the emperor continued to explain. He was to gather information about Bayan's past, and the emperor wanted every bit of information. From her birth up until the moment she'd left the village, nothing was to be left out. But Gay Rang was still stuck on the fact that he was to leave to gather this information. The emperor ignored his confusion and told him that his mission was to remain a well-kept secret since her past could potentially become her greatest weakness. But for what reason did the Muko have to accompany him, Gay Rang wanted to know. They would be fulfilling separate orders, and while they completed their tasks, Gerang would speak with the people of the village to acquire knowledge on Bayan. But Gerang was to also keep them distracted, and this shouldn't be too hard for him since he'd already met them once before, or so the emperor believed. Gerang grew anxious because, contrary to the emperor's opinion, he didn't have the most pleasant memories of the Ganek village. In particular, the scene he'd walked in on as Her Highness had almost been violated by one of the village elders, and as soon as that memory popped up, Gehring gasped as he recalled that village man's violent attack on Her Highness, and at the time, there hadn't been enough time to take care of that incident. He knew that when he showed his face once again, the men of that village would be none too pleased to see him, and they would most likely grow suspicious of him. If that were to happen, there would be no way they'd share any information about Her Highness. Gehring understood that he was not the right person for this job, but he couldn't explain this in front of the rest of the men in the room since this could reflect badly on Her Highness. He decided that he would inform the Emperor about this when it was just the two of them, but he was uncertain on how to ask the Emperor for a private audience.
He told the emperor that news of Bayan had surely traveled far and wide by now, and if it so happened to have reached her village, the village elders wouldn't speak freely about her, but the emperor told him that those were not the people he'd be gathering information from. This drew Gerang to a stop, and he looked questioningly at the emperor. The emperor explained his clever plan to Gerang. He would first tell them that the emperor adores his concubine so much that he decided to lift the taxes on the village, and hearing this news, they would celebrate joyously. Gerang gasped, shocked that the emperor would lift their taxes, but the emperor smirked slyly because, no, that was not something he would actually be doing. Upon hearing his words, Gerang sighed in relief, but he was still unconvinced that the emperor's plan would work and that the village people would offer up information on her highness. But the emperor suggested asking village girls of similar age to buy in because, since the once weak, bullied dark seo of the village had suddenly become the beloved concubine of the emperor, it was unimaginable that they would be happy with such news, and Gerang could use that to play on their jealousy. But the emperor may spare the life of one, if Gerang found someone who held true happiness for Bayan. His red eyes glowed dangerously at the thought of retribution he would soon unleash upon that village, and the men in the room stood silent, on edge, despite the emperor's delight at violence not being directed at them. Gerang knew by the look in his eye that he'd already set his sights on destroying the whole village, and Gerang realized now that seeing her highness in such a state of distress had truly provoked the emperor. And it made him all the more determined to tell the emperor about the incident at the village. He called out to the emperor, and he bowed, formally requesting a private audience. Silent for a beat, the emperor then ordered everyone out of the room aside from Gerang and Myonga. Once alone, Gerang stood quietly, but his nervousness was apparent. He told the emperor that he would be of no help in speaking to the villages since he'd seen too much of those villagers' misdeeds, and the emperor ordered him to explain. Gerang told the emperor that the day they left the village, her highness was violently attacked by a village elder, and she was possibly molested. His words stunned the emperor, silent for a moment, for when he spoke next, he said in a clipped voice, and, with restrained fury. His expectant voice caused Gerang to look up in confusion, and the emperor asked him what he had done about Bayan's attackers. Gerang paled, and he stuttered out that he'd asked her highness how she'd wanted to deal with the elder, and she told him that she'd wanted to kill that man along with a few others. The emperor was surprised that there was more than one man and that she'd wanted to kill them with her own hands no less. Gerang told the emperor about the conviction she'd spoken with as she'd uttered those words, but since they were short on time, they'd left, unable to deal with those men. The emperor called out to Peric, and the man instantly appeared before his master. The emperor asked if he too had seen the incident Gerang spoke about, and when he answered that he indeed witnessed it, the emperor wanted to know why he'd not reported the incident. Peric told the emperor that he deemed it of little importance, so he'd foregone it on the report. At his words, the emperor's entire aura turned ominous as he questioned, since when do shadows make such decisions? Gerang felt the emperor's threatening temperament, and he bowed as he begged the emperor to compose himself. But it seemed Gerang's words only flared the emperor's temper, and he asked in a quiet, rage-filled voice, Compose myself? How could he keep calm when he just heard that his concubine had been assaulted? The emperor asked Gerang why it had taken him so long to report this, and Gerang fell to his knees, stammering. He asked the emperor to forgive him for his oversight but the emperor was not done speaking. Looking at the fearful Gerang, the emperor wondered why he'd not reported it sooner when this was regarding the woman Gerang claimed to have a fondness for. He'd always allowed his subordinates to speak freely, and he'd bestowed upon them the power to resolve matters like this without the need for the emperor's intervention, yet he'd done nothing. I gave you authority so you'd use it for the common good, not to keep silent. The emperor spoke as usual, but they all felt the seething anger in his words. Berating Gerang once more, he said that if Gerang cared so little about matters concerning the woman he admired, how could the emperor expect him to take care of their people's needs? And it seemed that the corrupt nobles were not the only problem the emperor faced, but also issues closer to him. At his words, Gerang flinched, knowing he'd lost the respect the emperor held for him as his general, and on his knees he could blame no one but himself. He knew he should have known better.
At the time, he thought that by keeping quiet about the incident, he'd have been helping her highness, but he knew now that his reasoning had nothing to do with that. Because he'd been so wrapped up in his own conflicting emotions about her highness and the pity he'd held for his love that could never be, he'd cared for little else happening around him. He realized now the true selfishness of his actions, and it infuriated him. And as punishment for his negligence, Gerang slammed his head onto the ground repeatedly. The emperor watched him but did nothing to stop him. Mayanga watched on in worry that they might lose a good man on this day if no one stopped him for the injury Gerang inflicted on himself. According to the emperor's ruling philosophy, those who have power must work hard to show that they are worthy of it, and that work must be solely for the good of the empire and its people. But when Gerang had chosen silence over righteousness, this was something that had disappointed the emperor. Calling out to the emperor, Mayanga asked the emperor to please bestow generosity on them by allowing them a second chance. But the emperor had no patience for anyone that day because, as he looked at Mayanga menacingly he said, I did not ask for your opinion. Mayanga bowed an apology, and he knew that there was nothing else he could do, for no one who breathed the same air as them could appease the emperor when he was in such a state. But just as he thought that, a voice outside drew their attention as they asked for the whereabouts of the emperor. They announced the arrival of Her Highness, and Mayanga glanced back at the emperor. And looking at the emperor's flushed face at the mention of Bayan, Mayanga realized that there was indeed only one person who could calm the emperor down. 